Mark, dear friends, good morning. On behalf of Citizen Press, I now officially launch the book, Secrets of the CCP's United French Department by Mr. Chen Gaiyuan. The Chinese Communist Party's United French work was established just before the anti-Japanese war in the 1930s and flourished during the war. And more importantly, played a very, very important role in helping the CCP win the civil war against the KMT, Jiang Kai-shek. Mao Zedong rightly summarized the CCP's historical experiences under his leadership. Quote, the United Front armed struggle and a party building are the three secret weapons that the Chinese Communist Party deploys to defeat enemies in the Chinese Revolution, end quote. The so-called Chinese Revolution actually is a Chinese Communist Revolution. These ex experiences did not stop when the CCP is established the People's Republic of China. Rather, the United, United Front work went on to play an even larger role in helping the CCP control various strata of Chinese societies. The United Front, Tongzhan, became a ubiquitous existence and a presence in the political lives of Chinese, both in and outside the PRC. Tongzhan in Taiwan, for example, is universally understood uh, term. Despite its ubiquitous presence, the United Front work, its mission, scale of operations, and especially its concrete everyday work, largely remain a secret to outsiders, which are almost everyone. Chen Guangyuan's book, Secrets of the CCP's United Front Department, is an insider's account of the United Front system and its secret tactics. Mr. Chen had a very interesting background. Um, he was a legal scholar and a former Chinese communist uh, officer. He worked in the United Front apparatus in the 1960s. Mr. Chen was a Chinese soldier in the Korean War. He studied law and worked in China's central government before his United Front career. He was persecuted in the Cultural Revolution and later became, became a scholar of adm administrative law before retiring and immigrating to this country, the United States of America, where he is an active advocate for democracy and the rule of law in China. His main responsibility while he was working in the CCP's United Front Department involved the agency's efforts vis-a-vis -vis minor political parties, that is democratic, so-called democratic pro, uh, political parties, Minzhu Dangpai. He also became familiar with the department's dealings with business community and various religious groups. He was involved with uh, such sensitive work as receiving the Republic of China's former acting president, Li Zongren, Zhonghua Mingguo Dai Zongtong, Li Zongren, and China's last emperor, Ai Xinjie Luo Puyi. This book reveals the true nature 
of the United Front by telling a real story concerning real people. Readers may be surprised to find that the CCP's United Front tactics have hardly changed over the past half a century. And the, face, the farces described in this book are still being constantly replayed in China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Macau, and overseas Chinese communities. This book is the only memoir yet written by a former CCP United Front cadre about the apartment department itself. So it is highly valuable as a political reference and a historical record. I'm glad that we, the Citizen Press, run by Citizen Power Initiatives for China, made our little contribution in this regard by publishing and distributing this important book. Mr. Chen, unfortunately, uh, just went, uh, underwent a surgery and uh, cannot make it to this conference today. He lives in California. Now it's my honor to uh, call Mr. Chen to join us remotely. Uh, can you uh, get Mr. Chen? Hello. 非常好啊,非常高兴。现在我们有很多的记者在这儿,也有一个中共的专家Mark Stokes先生在这地方。现在就请您呢,给大家讲讲几句话,好吧?十分钟的时间,好吗? 我首先要感谢公民力量为我写的书的英文版的发行中文写了一本关于中共统当部揭秘的这么一本书这个是因为我的历史国外很多国家的学者专家我们家的文字感兴趣出版中国随着他的中共随着他在中国他的经济势力的增强他正在不仅是在顾虑他想在台湾在港澳地区实行所谓的大统帐而且在向西方国家大力的开展所谓的统帐上头就是用文化交流
把这个爱党啊，和把爱国把它变成爱党啊，啊，啊，进一步来蒙骗这个海外的这些华人啊，这是华人同啊，另外一个呢，所谓在建建立世界共同体这个这个旗帜下，也就是说。一种新的所谓的共产主义的国际主义，啊，要建立世界共同体，改变世界秩秩序的这个情况之下，把这个专制的国家，把这些邪恶的宗教势力啊，各种这个社会的这个反动力量结合起来，组成所谓的反对美国的这个这个统一战线。啊，这个两个东西啊，都在在西方国这这个参透啊，都是相当危险的。所以说，西方国家正面临着一个特洛马伊马伊斯的这个啊，呃，一个政治的一个这个这个挖心脏，这种新新的啊，没有硝烟的战争啊，正在悄悄的进行。因此呢。能够更加全面的、深入的来了解中共统统一战线的这个内幕，啊，为呃今后呃如何能够做到反对中共的这个倡透的这个这种做法啊，提找出一个正确的这个战略和策略。这就是我要写这个本书的目的，啊，所以在今天这个呃书的发布会上，我再一次对于这个书呃英文版的这个书籍的出版啊表示啊，呃提供帮助，提供很啊很多付出辛勤劳动的啊一个呃呃这个啊湾区的朋友或公公民力量。这个组织的这个朋友，以及丁毅先生啊，表示衷心的感谢啊，就是我要讲的这些话。嗯，谢谢陈先生，非常感谢你用这么多的心血写这本非常有益的书，我们都非常感激你，谢谢你。啊、uh, ，Our thanks uh be to uh Mr. Chen for writing up this very important book, and I'll. Thanks also be to、uh, those who help make this book as it is now published, distributed. One person especially we want to give thanks is Mr. Ding Yi.、Uh, he has done so much work and you know, work back and forth with us、um, for、um, the publication, the publishing of this book. Thank you, Ding Yi. If you are online, you will、uh, you will see this and.、Uh, 程先生，啊、呃，待一会儿可能有些问题问你，我们再跟你连线，好吗？现在我们现在请那个 Mark Stokes 先生给大家做一个评论，好不好？好。Now we are very lucky and honored to have Mr. Mark Stokes with us today.、Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Mark Stokes is Executive Director of the Washington-based Very important think tank, the pro,、uh, the Project 2049 Institute.、Um, Mark、uh, has tremendous experience in、uh, military strategies、uh, on China, especially、uh, PLA's、uh, political warfare and Taiwan. So he's a real expert in this field, and his bio. Is here. I think everyone have already、um, read it. I don't want to repeat it.、Um, according to Mr. Chen, United Front Department is a department of political warfare, psychological warfare, intelligence, 
and propaganda combined and aiming at Chinese everywhere in the world and uh, even extend to foreigners. And um, uh, I, I don't think we can find a better expert to comment on China, uh, Communist Party's uh, political warfare and the PLA's uh, warfare than Mark Stokes. Now we have uh, Mr. Mark Stokes mm -hmm. to have his comment. Yeah. First, th th thank you, Jin Li, for uh, the opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity to, to um, talk about one of my one of my favorite subjects. I am actually humbled uh, to be able to speak about this topic in, in the wake of um, an, an individual who has a lot of experience and has actually lived and breathed the United Front work. Um, I am going to uh, confess from the start that when it comes to the United Front work department or general doctrine and principles and strategy of the United Front work, it's something that I just I am a continue to be a student uh, actually. My, the research that I've done in the past is primarily on, um, it's probably looking at structure, structural issues. And, um, and as, uh, as we're talking, and I also confess, I have yet to read the, the, the book, so I am definitely gotta read this. This, this is exciting, actually. Um, but because there's just so much that at least those of us, in my view, um, Americans who, uh, who, who just, I don't think, understand it, I, I don't pretend to, to understand it completely also. I, I do relatively what I think are simple, simple stuff, and have been for several years. Um, my interest actually began, I have about maybe 10 minutes? 10 minutes, 10 uh, about 15, 10 minutes. Uh, it's, it's okay. all yours. Um, yeah. I, I began to become interested in this issue of political warfare, and let me start also by just discussing a bit on, on, on terminology or words. I'm not sure what to call it, it um, in terms of what terms to use, whether it's political warfare, uh, or whether it's influence operations, which is, of course is, is quite uh, popular here in the U.S., or perception management is another term that is used uh, fairly often. Uh, it, another term that's used fairly often is a political interference, uh, a term. Or one can also use uh, broadly, in, in, in broad terms, united front. That would be small u and small I, uh, f to distinguish it between uh, strictly the united front work department. But I became interested after I came back from, from, uh, from Taiwan um, I, I've been in Taiwan, I've been in government for 20, 20 years, both in the Air Force, 20 years Air Force, and then worked in um, uh, the Office of the Secretary of Defense, uh, uh, handling um, U.S. defense policy, or as, at the staff level, defense policy uh, with regard to the People's Republic of China and, uh, and, and Taiwan, uh, the Republic of China. And I, uh, and I had been in Beijing for three years. I was a, an assistant air attaché working at the U.S. Embassy. And I didn't really have much of a sense of this issue of political warfare. I'm just going to stick with that term because I think that's what a, a term that could be best used. Didn't have much of a sense, even when I was in policy. Just a actually didn't have a sense of, uh, particularly on the defense side within the PLA, about the PLA's role in political, uh, political military work, or to use their term, uh, military liaison uh, work. Uh, or to use an old term, it would be known as enemy work. Um, but didn't have much of a sense, and, and uh, you would think that I should have known that if I was uh, if I was in a position to be able to inform senior U.S. policymakers on military uh, on PLA military to military relations. <laughs> but it wasn't until I went to Taiwan. Uh, I was a uh, worked in the defense business there for a little while. Yes, I, uh, to use a term uh, that's often used, I was an arms dealer. I admit it. I'm a recovering arms dealer now, but uh, <laughs> worked in, in that field. Um, and there's other stories to be told about that, but. When I, uh, when I came back, I was not a good arms dealer. Uh, that just, I just found out that really wasn't my thing. I, I, I fully agree with the principle in terms of U.S. policy on arms sales, but just the actual mechanics of it, just something that uh, it just wasn't me. I'm just not very good at business. But, um, but after I came back, it was very interesting uh, because we were, uh, as an institute, we were very interested in, in uh, of course, as you know, in terms of trying to get funding and things. And so began to you know, engage um, yeah, you know, within uh, both here in the U.S., but also in uh, in Taiwan and in Hong Kong uh, also. Uh, and uh, but so in in the, in the midst of all this, um, I showed up. I got a call from a friend from Taiwan who said, "Mark, you didn't know this, but there was an article that showed up in something called Huan uh, Chiu Renwu or Renwu Chencho or something like that. I forgot, but it's an uh, adjunct of uh, uh, People's Daily. And the headlines were, you know, Mark Stokes, Shiming Kai." beats the drums to be able to make a lot of money. And 
look at the article, it's kind of interesting. Then it goes in and had a lot of detail. Whoever the author was did a lot of work in trying to figure out you know, my address and, and how much house cost and everything. Of course, they don't, he didn't, the author, uh, he or she, I, I, I forgot exactly who it was, but didn't bother to realize that when you buy a house in the US, you have 30, it's a 30 year payment, you actually have to pay for it and you're not buying a house. It's like buying a car, you have to do payments. And, but, um, but you know, claim I made a lot of money, which is not true a, at all. I'm kind of glad I, had, I did not. Um, but regardless, um, so then in Taiwan, you know, I worked with that reporter to be able to you know, set the record straight a little bit uh, because the, the, the methodology that they used was very sophisticated in terms of all the way from internet search optimization tools, keyword searches, and it come to find out that the strategy that was explained to me was actually, it wasn't, they had nothing against me personally, but it was using me to be able to go after other political people here in the U.S. by, you know, by associating themselves with a dirty Juno Zhang, you know, that kind of thing. And so that got me interested uh, in, in this issue. Then, of course, following it up with some other things that went on at the same time. Uh, but, and then uh, they got me interested. And then also became interested in um, a, another initiative that was launched by, by the, because most of my focus has been on PLA. Uh, and I became very interested in uh, what used to be the uh, PLA's General Political Department Liaison Department. Um, uh, because they were able to capture, it seemed like capture, some very seat, my former bosses in the Air Force uh, and in DOD, uh, to be able to, to establish a dialogue with other retired PLA military officers, very senior. But at the heart of this, that when began to do more digging, this would have been all the way back in 2009, be, began to sort of digging exactly who this organization, the General Political Department is. And over the course of the next, let's say, 2009, let's call it four years, um, just as a hobby, yeah, there was no funding, there's no back, <laughs> there's nobody that said go do this, it was just a personal interest of mine. Um, started to put together databases and just every piece I can find focused primarily on the, the um, let's call it GPD liaison department, general political department liaison department, Zhongjiang Lianobu, uh, and just anything I could find, but also st trying to figure out what's the relationship between the, the, this organization that I felt kind of stupid because I didn't know much about them before, um, and what's the relationship between them and other parts of the bureaucracy, looking at it from a structural approach. The United Front Work Department is very, very important. Uh, the um, other parts of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is, is certainly is, is important on uh, foreign relations, but uh, and the Ministry of State Security is going to be important, play an important role. Uh, the, the propaganda and the ideology system is going to be very important. Um, and so you start to look at, at structure of these things, and it becomes, it still didn't satisfy in terms of trying to better understand how the, how the way they do business. But the basic principle, for example, of the liaison department, uh, so then began to, in order to understand today, maybe look a bit at history. Um, and so began to do a little bit more history about how did this all begin. Uh, there was reference about the start with in the 1930s. And sure enough, that was when, um, they're, they're uh, just based on readings, and I am very open to being educated, uh, there appeared to be when, uh, basically rooted in underground work with three different organizations. Uh, the organization I was primarily focused on and getting a better understanding was the enemy work system. Uh, it was be the enemy, Diren. Uh, 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 or whatever you want to call it, you know, the enemy work system, as well then as the um, uh, urban work system, uh, urban work system that's focused on, on percentages of, of high stature. Uh, and, and then, so the ur urban work department, none of it. And then the social, the social work system. So yeah, uh, these, these are sort of the three key elements. And then trying to get a sense of how these three different systems evolved into, for example, the, the, on the PLA side, the enemy work system was fairly easy in terms of transition. It changed, changed its name in 1955. Uh, but in terms of trying to get names of the senior leadership, uh, of course, the, tr tr the, the connection to Taiwan became clear because there were some very senior enemy work officers that were actually had origins in Taiwan um, th uh, that, uh, that I just found fascinating. Uh, a lot of the enemy work people also morphed over to become the leadership of the newly formed International Liaison Department, the Central International Liaison Department. Um, the urban work, uh, just in terms of trying to trace where it went, it appeared to trace, uh, roughly morph into the United Front uh, Work Department. And with the uh, um, Social Work Department, again, very roughly, it's not perfect, morphing into what eventually became today as the, well, eventually the Central Investigation Department and then, then finally into the Ministry why? of State Security, uh, Ministry of State Security. Mm -hmm. But these were sort of the three, the three key, uh, three key elements. But then trying, you know, and then looking through history, tracing the, the enemy work department and then liaison department, 
uh, active, of course, in, in Korean War, um, active in uh, the um, operations in Tibet, 19, early 1950s. Uh, certainly active, um, my understanding, uh, there, there's, a black, there's a dark spot in the Cultural Revolution. There seems to be indications that the uh, in, uh, Liaison Department, PLA, took over, to many respects, the Central International Department for a while. But then that would have been a lot of the international revolutions that went over in Southeast Asia. Uh, but then really was revived, uh, they still in operation, but really revived in the early 1980s when they began to establish some of these platforms. 1980s, uh, pl uh, some platforms that existed been around for a long time, like CPPFAC or something like that. Chinese People's uh, like uh, Association for International Friendly, not contact, but um, by, but it, it's run by uh, Li, Li Xiaolin. Uh, her, her organization. The, the, those, that, that, that organization. Yeah. But looking at all these different organizations, these, uh, um, um, these different uh, organizations that are sensibly were not you know, non-governmental, uh, but trying to develop a connection to find out what home they had. With the liaison department, fairly, fairly, fairly straightforward uh, because you can identify how they are. Like, for example, China Association of National Friendly Contact or Yo, Yo, Yo Lian Wei, yeah. um, uh, th these types. Um, f fairly, fairly easy. Uh, there's other ones. The United Front Work Department has certain platforms, particularly the Council for Promotion of National Reunification, uh, th th these, uh, these types. But, um, but you know, then try to do a, a, a structural breakdown of the, the main focus areas of the, uh, the General Political Department Liaison Department. Um, but the, the key question throughout all this really is just um, how is everything coordinated? In other words, because the PLA, General Political Department Liaison Department, even within the PLA, you're going to have uh, the liaison department. But you also have the second department. Uh, that would be the uh, Song San, Song San, Arbu, 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 Arbu. The, 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 these, these types. You know, and the best examples in the U.S. in terms of Arbu involvement were allegedly, again, I'm not sure if it was ever completely proven, but there's some significant evidence uh, involved, for example, some of the campaign, fi campaign financing schemes in the, 19, uh, in the 1990s um, in terms of funneling money through, through Hong Kong. Uh, there had been uh, indications within the PLA, uh, of course, the third department, uh, of course, all these have changed names, but that would be the Tsong San Sambu, you know, the guys that do the uh, listening and the cyber. Yeah. Um, in terms of, the, of course, they, they would ob obviously would have to play a key role in terms of supporting political work operations and the United Front operations. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but there's still, you know, in doing the research, and uh, finally by 2013, uh, our institute, uh, um, Russell Xiao and myself, we did publish a study on, um, on the general political department uh, looking at political warfare with Chinese char characteristics. It was just intended to be sort of a preliminary assessment, but there's so much more uh, these days to, to learn, uh, particularly today. My focus today, um, again, it's just as a hobby, is, is just still trying to figure out in terms of um, um, how the Chinese Communist Party um, how they try to influence, uh, in general, for example, the United States and our uh, regional uh, uh, allies and, 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 and partners. How, um, in the U.S., certainly there's, there, there appears to be some political interfer uh, interference, um, but trying to figure out, for example, how they were able to affect U.S. policy uh, and other questions that, that sort of drive continuing research is how do they, can you identify a campaign? Sometimes you can't identify a campaign but how these campaigns are coordinated across the bureaucracy because it takes a, a sort of a, almost a form of United Front uh, work within the Communist Party itself to coordinate what the PLA does, the political work system does, to include the second department and the third department, uh, but also what the United Front work department does, what their role is, what the role of the Chinese uh, people, the, the um, um, geez, CPPA, um, the, um, geez, uh, um, Yoshi, uh, Zhengxia, uh, Zhengxia. Th these, th this organization. You know, what, what their role is, like Xi Zhong Dong Jinhua is one of many, like maybe 12, at least a half dozen uh, uh, vice chairman of the uh, CPPCC. Mm -hmm. uh, but what's, what's the role of the propaganda and uh, ideology system? Uh, for example, the Central Propaganda Department. Here in the U.S., the Confucius Institutes, who, in terms of chain of command, who actually do Confucius Institutes like Hanban? Who, do, who, who does Hanban work for? Ministry, uh, presumably Ministry of Education, but the Ministry of Education, what is his role within the Central Propaganda Department? Um, but it, it, it's just questions like this that I'm still trying to figure out is how it's coordinated. And if there is one central authority somewhere, presumably at, at maybe at the, uh, the Politburo level, the Politburo Standing Committee level, theoretically there should be one staff organization that develops a strategy uh, for uh, influence operations or political warfare, uh, um, or one could also say Leninist statecraft. I'm not sure what term one wants to use. 
uh, in, in terms of um, uh, being able to influence both covertly and, and directly uh, uh, U.S. policy, but also being able to uh, carry out political in interference and influence operations uh, in Taiwan itself. Um, and um, Philippines is another one I think that does not get as much attention as it should, uh, but it's also in Japan. Uh, it is uh, Burma uh, is another uh, big target country, uh, but it's all over in Europe, of course. Czech Republic uh, is just the best example. But, but all these things, so I'm, I'm sort of presenting here more, more questions than, than I have really uh, definitive uh, answers. But this is a subject that I'm really happy to see is getting um, a, a lot more attention. And, um, and I'll sort of turn it back. Uh, one other quick, uh, um, sort of leaving on one other quick uh, um, ane anecdote is, um, is, is still, uh, yeah, I think I'll just leave it there and turn okay. it back over and maybe perhaps uh, um, uh, and sort of leave it op open for questions. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you Mark. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, let's see. Thank you, Mark, for your um, very informative talk, and thank you for your insights. Mm -hmm. You did raise uh, very interesting questions. Uh, we're all interested in trying to find the uh, answers to them. Now we open to uh, uh, audience and the press. Uh, Mr. Cheng is still there. Cheng Xianheng is still there. Now, now we have questions that can be directed to uh, Mr. Chen, the author, or uh, Mr. Mark uh, Stokes. Yeah. You just mentioned that the work of the war in Hong Kong, the strength of the war in Hong Kong, is very strong. But when you see the situation in Hong Kong, do you think that you can say that their work has been destroyed, or has been destroyed, or has been destroyed? 你会觉得未来他们在香港会投进更大的力度去做统战的工作？你怎么样看香港？呃，中共以后对对于香港的统战的工作？谢谢。从现在香港的局势的发展来看，呃，中共所谓的一国两制，它本身就是一个争统战的一个陷阱，是一个骗局。因此呢，这个他们原来就是想通过“一国两制”这个形式，啊，把香港呢变成了一国一制。因此，他们现在司法系统开始下手，想取消香港的司法独立，啊，进而进一步的控制香港的这个，呃，人民的这个权利。这个这个，由于由于他们在所作所为，已经逐渐的被香港人民认得，啊，对他们这些做法看得更清楚了。因此，不管他们将来用任何的新的统战的形式来，来呃新的口号、新的这个啊这个所所谓的这个统战的这个策谋略，他都很难。在啊、呃，在香港人民中间，啊，能够取得香港人民的这个呃对“一国两制”的这个信任，啊，所以最终呢，他们是啊、呃、不可能啊完全控制香港的。呃，我来问一个问题啊，呃，我觉得这个陈先生点出了这个呃中共统战部的一个核心，那么这个核心就是欺骗 （deceptive）。有 deception， 我觉得这个是可能，呃，是统战部的他的一个主要的呃这个策略，就是欺骗。那我想问的问题就是说，现在中共这个统战部啊，他已经可能发生了比较大的变化，尤其是职能上面，可能是扩大了很多。呃，严格说起来的话呢，恐怕这是中国在海外可能在世界最大的一个。呃，情报组织，呃，因为它它是跨，既是国内也是国外，国内的所有的非党派的民主人士，工商联，然后宗教、宗教、民族，呃，海外的所有的华人、华侨、知识分子，全部在他掌控之之内，所以他这个范围啊是非常之大，就是他这个系统是非常之大。我想请陈先生是不是能够呃确认一下？现在它的这个变化和它在世界上的这个海外的渗透啊
呃起的这些作用，它主要的通过什么样一种呃欺诈的方式，呃这个欺骗的方式来呃完成共产党在海外的渗透这样的一个职能的？谢谢。刚才这位先生讲的他很对，就是现在呃。中共所在所谓的大外宣、大统胀的这个策略下面，啊，已经把他的这个这个统胀策略，啊，呃，通过各种形式啊，传播到这个世界各个各个国家，啊，特别是通过“一带一路”，他其首先想通过啊。啊，这个非洲啊，这个美啊和这个一些小的国家，啊，把他们呢利用他们国所谓的国维护自己的国家利益这种这种这个愿望啊，利用的愿望啊，把他们把他们结成一个所谓反美的统一战线，企图改变世界的这个新这个世界的些秩序啊，呃，从战略上。他们来啊，形成一个对西方这个啊，这个美以美国为首的自由国家的一个参照和包围啊，也来谋取他们想在世界建立红色霸权的这样一个目的。嗯，程先生好，呃，我想问您一个问题呢，是呃，根据您在统战部的工作经验。呃，那么在统战部工作的这些中共的干部们，他们在做工作的时候，本身知道是在做欺骗，还是说您离开统战部以后，根根据自己的领悟，才发现共产党这个统战部实际上是在做欺骗性的工作？哎，这个这个问题啊，我想这样子。就作为统战部的工作人员，他他们也是强调一个，就是叫内外有别啊。就共产党一贯对统战工作人员他所进行的极力教育，叫政治极力的教育，啊。实际上呢，如果说你不是啊完全啊去呃这个把自己啊这个思想。完全是以这个啊，呃，被啊，就是说这个洗脑了，是吧？呃，那你这个实际上是可以看出来，所谓的内外有别，这个本身就是两套标准，两种行为，就对外一套，对内一套，啊，那这种做法本身呢，就是说是带有欺骗性的，啊，带有这个啊一种欺诈的形式，一种政治欺诈的形式。啊，这个呢，实际上很多统战工作人员，他们并不是说都不清楚，实际上他们都知道他们在做什么，是吧？但是因为这个，在在这个呃这个组织本身严格的政治纪律控制下，啊，人家都不能够这表达他自己的自由意志嘛，这个情况。啊，呃，陈先生。在你这个了解中共的整个统战体系和统战的这个，呃，所有的这些事情里面，呃，你你认为有哪几个团体或者哪几个组织呢？反统战或者这个他们碰到了这个统战上碰到了障碍，或者是，呃，使得他们的统战失败，这方面的例子或者成功的经验有没有？你了解的这个中共的统战工作中碰到了失败，或者是现在全世界，呃，这个反统战的体系，或者是瓦解他统战体系的这样的国家，哪几个国家做的比较好？呃，因为这个我做的这个工作是吧？这个是呃很多年以前的，在统战内部的这个工作是吧？这统战的这个失败与不失败这个问题上，实际上有很多是通过历史的这个认知来，比方说，共产党原来在在没有夺取政权之之前，有很多这个国内的知识分子啊，民所谓民主人士
，他们都是拼命的，就是说，呃，按照这个共产党的口径来反对啊，一个一个劲的反对国民党政府嘛，啊，反对这个中华民国的这个这个所谓合法政府。那么通过后来通过这个历史以后，原来统战部呢，他他这个统战本身他就是作为一个工具来看的，是吧？他是就过河拆桥，这个是。统战的这个必然规律，他到了，他可以利用的时候，他就利用；他不利用的时候，这就他我策略就改变了。因此，在后面的所谓呃思想改造、反右斗争啊，以及文化大革命，这些人都被啊清除了啊，就得到了这个历史的这个沉重的教训啊，这些人大家受到了受到了惩罚，对吧？历史的惩罚，那么在现在这个情况之下，啊，然后有有一些西方的这个政治家啊，他们因为通过历史的教训，已经开始清醒的认识到，啊，中共统战是一个啊阴谋，是一个陷阱，因此呢，他们就开始抵制这个问题。至于这个不是说哪一个国家啊做得好，哪一个国家做得不好。啊，而是现在已经是形成一个趋势，就是说，逐步的，呃，是呃很多这个西方的这个政治精英啊，开始转变了对中共统战问题的认知，是吧？与这个认知的深入，那这个就各种程度不同。这个其中呢，有一些是因为利益的交换，他们已经上了这个这这船了，下不了船了。那这个就没办法了，是吧？就很难陷得很深，是吧？对，这个就是这么个情况。Doctor Han, yeah. I I have a question for for Mark. Um, I think uh, uh, as an expert, um, I would like to know how much do you think the American government understand the the nature and the magnitude and scope of the United Front work? Thank you. <coughs> My impression that it has, I mean, it's over the last couple of years, um, I, I think awareness has increased significantly. Understanding there's still a lot more to understand, um, but I would have to give credit to, um, in terms of popularity this notion, I mean, here in Washington, there, there's been, uh, over the years, there's been bits and pieces that have come out. Um, I give credit to, um, all the way back in the early, early 2000s, late 1990s, there's been some, I mean, actually, understanding has gone back to the 1950s in some ways, there is more of an understanding in Washington about United Front activities and influence mm -hmm. operations in the United States in the 60s um, than, than there, in some ways than there is now. Um, in the 1950s and 1960s, it was clear that uh, generally authoritarian, particularly Marxist-Leninist forms of government, were a big problem. And it was clear in terms of sort of lines of, lines of competition. Uh, Jean Kirkpatrick delineated different types of authoritarian regimes. But, um, but since then, it's become not, it, it became not popular to be able to criticize Marxist-Leninist forms of governments, for example, and with, uh, with um, Chinese Communist Party, just to be able to say, oh, they're not communists, but, and get into deba you know, esoteric debates like, like this, um, but, but not even wanting to say, well, they're just like us. They, you know, everybody does influence operations, but um, I mean, just forgetting that influence operations or political warfare, um, generally what makes it different is, is, is the three Cs, corrupt, uh, covert, or, or clandestine, and um, coercive. Uh, so, I mean, that makes it a bit different than what democracies do. Everybody does try to influence. But, but these days, I, I would give credit to, to some extent, um, the impact of, um, um, I would say, Emory Brady. I would have to give some credit to, to her for her, her paper titled uh, uh, Magic Weapons. Um, mm -hmm. I would, um, that helped to popularize uh, this issue quite a bit in Washington, published out of Wil Wilson Center. Mm -hmm. um, there was an effort that were going on from a, a group of there, there, I mean, there were a group of us that, that were um, working together uh, from different countries, including Czech Republic, Australia, uh, Emory Brady, New Zealand, uh, 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 around uh, in, in Taiwan, uh, to be able to sort of get a better feel for what this, the nature and the scope of the problem. Mm -hmm. um, but, so I would say that over the last couple of years, I, I think there's been uh, progress, but there still is a lot more work uh, to do, uh, I, I think, in better understanding. I, I do the re relatively simple stuff, again, just like I'm just looking at structure. Uh, for example, the first question I look at United Front Work Department is, you know, the roles of the different bureaus. You start with the, there's a research and there's a, uh, like a research office, 
uh, there's like almost like a United Front Work Department think tank, but then you have you know, first bureau, I think down through, uh, let's just notionally call it nine, or I forgot how many bureaus, but, but try to get a sense of how structure also impacts uh, influence. So if I could actually ask a question of the yes, professor. Yes. Um, oh. uh, so I'm not sure if you can uh, uh, hear me, but one of my questions is when, it, when you look at the different organizations that have a role in, um, in United Front Work, not just the United Front Work Department, but also, for example, the Central Propaganda Department, or now they call it Publicity Department in English, but the, the Central Propaganda Department, the PLA, Political Work System, um, and the M Ministry of State Security, uh, and many, many other different organizations. How is this, how would United Front Work be coordinated across the bureaucracy? Mm -hmm. For example, the United Front Work Department Director Theoretically, I think should be now. I think Politburo member, but for several years, Shang Buji. I think it used yeah, yeah. to be, uh, but now now it's been elevated. Yeah. No, no, yes, yeah. uh, so uh, elevated in stature. Yeah. But mm. but when you look at just straight bureaucracy, um, you know they're all trying to put themselves together in a yeah. to, in, in harmony, to like, a, like an orchestra. Yeah. But for everything to be effective, there theoretically should be one central staff organization that develops strategy. And oversees implementation. Yeah, so today, yeah. would this be uh, would this be uh, General Secretary Xi Jinping, yeah. or would it be Huang Huning, or would it still be Central Military Commission, or National Security Council, or, or, or ne uh, National uh, Security Council, or recently it's the uh, Yes. Yeah. Um, Let me ask. Uh, sure. Yeah. Translate. Yeah. Okay. Chen 先生，刚才你听到他的问题了吧？我给你翻译一下好吗？啊，他是讲啊。像这个这个统战部，还有和统战部这个相关的一些工作，像这个军队的这个总政，像这个呃这个还有一些国家安全部门，还有这个总参的等等这些，呃相类似的，呃能不能让他关上？是谁呀、啊？嗯嗯嗯，是不是中共派来的？嗯、啊。统战部派来的，啊，就这些工作，它是相关的，它是怎么协调的？它是怎么协调的这些工作？那么一个是这个部门之间的协调机制，再一个现在是谁统管？这个统管是在习近平手里呢，王沪宁手里呢，还是现在刚刚成立的国家安全会？就他想了解结构性的东西。啊，嗯，呃，关于这个问题啊，这个。从历史上来看呢，它这个互相都是有联系的啊，就是过去这个，呃，在没有成立国家安全部以前，就公安部有个一局叫政治保卫局，它就是和统战部有个保持一个联系的，还有一个联系工作，这个，呃，一个一个工作的联系制度的，啊，还有呢，就是宣传部门。啊，组织部门它都有有联工作联系制度，有一个啊一个呃呃工作的一个交流制度。因为统战部门它牵涉到呃形式很多，牵涉到部门很多啊。比方说，他呃要对所谓的统战对象进行这个历史的审查，这个就是要依靠组织部门来做的啊。因此呢。他过去不是讲叫统战部门是统党外人士的啊这个良家啊，实际上就说他对党外人士所有的言行一切行动都要进行一个历史的啊各方面的这个背景的调查，那这些工作很多是由于组织部门来做的，所以他们就要交换定期的交换工作意见是吧？呃，还有呢，就是说他采取的这种文化交流的办法。啊，比方说在海外搞的这些所谓的文化交流机构啊，啊，什么这个呃、啊、宣扬这个中国文化的这些，这个跟文化部、跟宣传部是有关系的，因此他们也作为协调，啊，那么这个统管、统战部门统管的这个啊，它是中央呢，它主要是由于这个啊中央政治局的。啊，分管统战工作，也就现在一般都是由政协主席，呃，由政协委员，呃，就是政治局委员的，呃，政治局
这个常委这边的这这些主席来同同意啊，同管的啊，他是这样子，所以他这个这个机构呢，他的本身他就是一个。啊，有很多这个协调这个这个这个工作的协调这个这个工作机制的啊，过去都是有固定的工作汇报会的啊。那么在一个地方上，它就是由地方的这个啊所谓的这个分管统战工作的书记，他专门有一个啊这个党委的这个书记来做这个协调和啊主主管的这个工作，就是这么一个情况。Oh, Mark, I have a question. Maybe the last one. Huh? Uh, one last question. Uh, Taiwan is going to have a general election uh, this coming Saturday. Really? <laughs> really? No, no, no. <laughs> it has been a lot of talks about uh, infiltration from China. No, we, you, we can call it it's a United Front work. And um, Taiwan just passed an uh, anti-infiltration law. You know, uh, so th that's an example to show that Taiwan now is trying to find measures to counter the influence from China. So do you want to comment on the situation there? The law passed, the how effective and uh, you know, any strategies Taiwan should take up? Well, uh, I, I, I would, but my first thing, I, I'm going again plead, I have not looked in detail, I haven't read the actual that infiltration uh, or in, interference yeah. law yet. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But in terms of the general situation, um, it is Taiwan, of course, is a uh, is a fertile ground for United Front operations. Uh, mm -hmm. I sometimes wonder, uh, as an American, uh, I I prefer to avoid getting involved myself in into Taiwan domestic politics. Roughly speaking, you have two major political uh, uh, organizations: Party, yeah. of course, DPP and KMT. Kim, Kim. Um, I am of the view, and and for not to take sides uh, either way, uh, in terms of results of the election, I would say 50-50. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just being very, very safe, 50-50, um, ah. <laughs> uh, because if you say there's a 70% chance one side will win, then you're going to get accused because you're trying to create a new reality. Right. Uh, but in my view, from an American policy perspective, I can, I'm more comfortable speaking about right. it. In American policy, you have to start with objective reality, uh, because what, in terms of a basic principle, uh, my view is that the Communist Party tends to view, I mean, they, they, if you say something often enough, um, it becomes reality. So, but they live in a different sort of reality. The reality is, is that Taiwan, under its current Republic of China constitution, exists as an independent sovereign state. That, that is, I, I've lived in Beijing, I've lived in Taipei, each of them three years, and I just, I, that, that's Very the reality. Balanced. What's that? What's that? <laughs> Very uh, balanced. Uh, yeah, so, but this is a case where policy, because of Beijing's views, um, in, if you move more toward extending legitimacy to whatever government is in power in Taiwan, whether it's the KMT or this DPP, Beijing authorities will view it as, they view this competition as a zero-sum game. In their view, the ROC ceased to exist in 1949. And so, in, in, in my view, their whole goal, of course, is related, just like in Hong Kong, uh, is one country, two system, in which there's one China, Taiwan's part of China, and the PRC is the sole representative of China in the international community. So, therefore, anything that the United States does to extend legitimacy to the ROC, or Taiwan, whatever term you want to use, that's viewed as a direct assault against legitimacy of the Communist Party. I personally am an advocate and have been, I was just in Taipei not too long ago, an advocate of, um, of the U.S. doing more to balance legitimacy, not taking a position on sovereignty, but doing more to balance legitimacy to governments on both sides of the, of, of the Taiwan Strait. After all, the status quo is the existence of two legitimate governments on both sides. Mm -hmm. Arguably, the ROC, or Taiwan, is more legitimate than the PRC because of the nature of the political system. I'm not sure how the Communist Party claims any legitimacy at all. Mm -hmm. But with U.S. policy, we extend legitimacy every single day that we don't have an ROC formal representative office here in Washington, D.C. And the, the biggest success of Beijing's political warfare, in my view, historically, was in 1970, you could say 77, but certainly 79, when we switched diplomatic relations away mm -hmm. from the ROC. It never right. had to be that way. We could continue to have relatively normal relations with both sides. Right. But today, we extend legitimacy to the Chinese Communist Party, and we withhold legitimacy from a government that's evolved into a lively democracy. What signals does this send to the rest of the world? No wonder the Freedom House and others actually talk about a backsliding of democracy around the world, mm -hmm. whenever the U.S. itself extends legitimacy <coughs> and withholds legitimacy. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, uh, Bert, you have a very brief question. A brief question. Very brief, yeah. Yes. Um, 
Kurt Wise, I'm pro bono counsel to IFC. And my question is, do you know if there has been any debate within the current administration, which has reversed a lot of previous positions, to according um, more recognition or acceptance of Taiwan's status here in Washington? I mean, there, I mean you can look at certain discrete actions that, that have been taken. Um, in, in, in my view, there's still limitations. Congress, of course, has done quite a bit. Um, but uh, th there's still going to be hesitancy. I mean, bureaucracies work very slowly. Yeah. I, I think there's a general movement in understanding that people understand the uh, people understand the, the, the narrative that has existed for a long time. Um, I, um, I, I I tend to advocate. This, uh, people don't like when I use this term, but I tend to, in Chinese it's called Mei Yijong Liangfu, Mei Mei Yijong Liangfu, which is a U.S. Mm. One China Two Governments policy. Mm. Um, it's just where you balance governments, meaning you do as much you can to gradually increase legitimacy to governments on both sides of the Taiwan Strait. Yijong Liangfu. Uh, but but um, I I don't see. Uh, it working in this direction, um, not necessarily. I think there's been some uh, marginal, I mean, some very, uh, uh, some changes, but th the real core, I've not seen any indication that now, you know, te Tecro, which is the, their formal uh, office here, they can even raise the ROC flag in public and make a, and make a media conference about it. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think there's still a lot more to do in a careful way, in a careful way to do more to balance legitimacy with both sides. Right. All right, let's, um, I think we should end uh, our uh, question answer session. And uh, we are running out of time. We have still another item to take care of. Uh, Dr. Wang, you have, um, I give you floor. You want to sell a few books or you give books to an uh, audience? 